When it comes to platformers, alongside many other successful franchises, there's Mega Man, Capcom's shining jewel. After the initial boom of sales from the second installment in the series, Capcom made sure to take advantage of the success as much as possible, continuously pumping out Mega Man games for the foreseeable future. So as we all know, with success that massive, sustained over the years by each continuation of the series, comes the release of spin-offs. And taking a page out of its competitor's book, Capcom would tackle the RPG genre. Hello everyone, this is the RPG Monger, and today let's talk about the incredible rise of Mega Man Battle Network. Developed as a launch title for Nintendo's newest Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance, the developers of Battle Network based the core concepts of the project around things that were popular at the time, mainly the semi-recent boom of trading card games and popular games associated with them like Pokemon for example. The question is, how would they merge something like that with a platformer like Mega Man? To put it simply, they needed to make something entirely new, and that's exactly what they did. Rather than the robot-focused world that Mega Man games usually surround, Battle Network is based on a what-if scenario the world being the result of technology going towards the development of networks and the internet instead of robots. It's a neat setup that creates a believable future, especially with the game releasing in 2001, right when the internet was in a period of sizable growth. So rather than being a robot, in Battle Network, Mega Man is a program called a NetNavi, serving as a kind of electronic companion for the main protagonist, Lan. Think something like Siri, except rather than constantly misunderstanding what you say, it's your best friend and goes into the internet to fight viruses and other series. Maybe even an Alexa or two. And rather than being in something like a smartphone, navvies are usually contained in what's essentially a smart Game Boy Advance called a pet. Though on that note, before talking about the game's world anymore, let's talk about the main reason you'll want to play Battle Network in the first place, the battle system. Pushing active turn-based battles to a whole new level, Battle Network features a fast-paced innovative battle system that takes place on 18 different panels, 9 for Mega Man.exe and 9 for the enemy. In battle, both you and the enemy can can move on to any panel that's on your side, movement serving as a way to both dodge incoming attacks and line attacks up to the panel the enemy is on. Already, it's an incredible basis for the game's battles, the simplicity of it providing a lot of space to implement further mechanics surrounding the panels in battle. But that's only half of it. While you can shoot an enemy in battle or hold the button down to use a charge attack, the real attacks you use come in the form of chips. Serving as the game's answer to adding some form of trading card concept into the game, battle chips each contain a unique attacker action, chips also being assigned a certain letter. Normally, you can only select one chip out of the selection you're given each time the custom gauge fills up, but when chips have the same letter or are the same type of chip, you can select as many apply, producing a definite tactical aspect throughout the game. The importance of building a folder with chips that correspond to one another being vital, and adding on to that, if you manage to line up certain chips that have the same code or their codes line up alphabetically, Mega Man can use a program advance, allowing you to use a far stronger stronger attack than normally possible. Let me tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than lining one of these up, especially if you're fighting a boss and need to do damage fast. I only wish I would've taken advantage of program advances sooner, as I kinda didn't until halfway through the second game. Look, I know I'm dumb. Sometimes Monkey Brain sees powerful chips, and that just overrides actually setting things up strategically. Also, when you want to have a wider selection of chips in a battle, the Add button will temporarily add another row to select from, at the cost of a turn. Though to get more chips to use in battle, most actually come from enemies, their main attack or an aspect of it usually being contained in a chip, the most powerful chips coming from other navvies on the off chance that you fight one. And outside of battles, you can customize Mega Man to make him stronger, giving him certain armors that make him strong against certain elements, and applying power-ups you can find to strengthen one of three stats. It's seriously such a great battle system, and being perfectly honest, when it comes to actually dodging attacks on the panels, Battle Network can seriously put you to the test some fights requiring your absolute focus to win. But anyways, while the battle system is one of the best parts of the game, it's not the only thing Battle Network has going for it. You see, with the game being centered on the internet and networks, Battle Network has the charm of how the internet was perceived in the early 2000s, and as someone who grew up in that time, it has a very specific nostalgia to it that not many things have. And while traveling across the internet as millions of E's fly by is great and all, one of my favorite bits is the ability you have throughout the game to jack into all sorts of devices. Not only is it neat seeing all the unique dialogue of the programs inside, but it gives you a minor sense of discovery each time Lan finds another thing to jack into. Plus, every time you find a new one, there's bound to be at least one useful item to get inside, so it's always worth your time. Though before I gush about Battle Network anymore, it's time to go into its story.
Set in the futuristic year of 20XX, Battle Network is based on a pretty probable future, even more so now than when the game was made, where just about everything in your everyday life is connected to the internet. Basically, it's a world of smart devices, something that in the current year has already kind of started happening. The problem is, rather than appliances and computers having adequate protection to prevent viruses, everything in the Battle Network universe may as well be running on McAfee, as it seems like every other day there's a smart device that causes mayhem after being being hacked. And above all the criminals who commit these net crimes, none are more prolific than the Net Crime Syndicate World 3, or the WWW as it's abbreviated, which of course is led by this universe's version of Dr. Wily. In fact, the game practically starts off with one of these net crimes, as the protagonist Lan Hikari has to prevent his house from being burnt down after his oven starts spewing flames. The perpetrator of the hacking obviously being this game's version of Fireman, operated by a guy who definitely has the looks for the part, that's for sure. Then, not too long after that, World 3 strikes again, this time attacking Land's school with Numberman.exe, operated by a World 3 operative named Higsby. As opposed to the last attack, here things begin getting slightly more serious, as under the guise of a substitute teacher, Higsby projects World 3 propaganda on the blackboards of each classroom, attempting to brainwash both students and teachers in the process. Thankfully, Lan had Mega Man put a stop to Numberman, but things only escalate from here. Next, World 3 takes a much larger leap, and somehow manages to completely shut down the town's waterworks, a plan that only succeeded due to the group blackmailing a scientist into using his Navi Iceman to freeze the programs themselves. Lan soon discovering that the true perpetrator is Colorman.exe, another World 3 member that managed to escape the scene. Gotta say, this was probably my least favorite stage in the game, the ice mechanics getting kind of annoying after a while. Of note, during this segment, Lan runs into an official net battler named Chod, who over the course of the game would quickly become his rival fittingly being the operator of Protoman.exe. And speaking of Color Man, after nearly the entire population of ACDC Town almost got poisoned from polluted water, Color Man and their operator once again caused another disaster, multiple cars crashing or losing control after hacking the traffic system of Den City. Like honestly, if it was always this easy to corrupt such an important system that literally holds lives in balance, how has this world not succumbed to chaos sooner? Regardless, a couple traffic light mechanics later, and a relatively easy easy fight with Color Man, the day is saved once again. But before continuing on with the story, at this point of the game, there's actually a few optional boss fights you can do, all of them far more challenging than the mandatory boss fights up until now. Of the three, Skull Man and Wood Man are both mildly challenging, their mechanics requiring a good bit of strategy. And then, there's Shark Man. You see, up until here, I thought I was decently alright at playing Battle Network, but once I lost to Shark Man for probably the 20th time, I was proven especially wrong. It's no exaggeration to say that throughout my entire playthrough of Battle Network 1, Shark Man is without a doubt the hardest fight in the game. It probably has to do with me not being remotely prepared for it, to be fair, but man did it take me a while to beat him. And don't even get me started on Shark Man version 2 or 3, I still have the nightmares. Anyways though, next up we've got another take on a classic robot master, Elec Man, who fittingly shuts down the power of the science lab right when Lan was there with his family. I've gotta say, out of all the redesigns this game has to offer, Elecman.exe is probably one of my favorites, and alongside him, I hope you like lighting puzzles because that's the main mechanic this time. Plus next to that, this stage has a much more amplified sense of urgency than the rest, since as you go through the stage, if you take too long, the pet's battery will run out, preventing Mega Man from healing after each battle. And while that's a pretty big threat on its own, nothing will ever strike me with more shock than Battle Network backhanding me with a reference I never thought I'd see again. Glad to see this is where Partners in Time got their inspiration from. But getting back on track, after you've braved the trials of early 2000s memes, it's time to destroy a Lechman, the fight going pretty smoothly, only for Proto Man to show up and challenge you directly afterwards. If up until now you haven't fought any of the optional bosses, Proto Man will be a pretty big challenge, his defense is only lowering right after he attacks, forcing you to strategize how to deal damage. It's just a shame Battle Network 1 doesn't have too many more fights that force you to rethink your approach like that, since now we're already beginning to approach the end. You see, even though World 3's attacks would seem to be purely to cause destruction, they've actually been after four special programs, with the attack on the Science Lab's generator allowing them to steal the final one. So with pretty much all their plans succeeding, the only thing left to do is confront World 3 at their headquarters, Mega Man fighting Bomb Man to gain the address to World 3 servers, and soon discovering that beneath Land's school all this time, there's been a secret metro line running straight to the main World 3 lab. Then, with the help of all the allies you've met along the way, 
way, LAN infiltrates World 3, each part of the final stage containing a different mechanic previously seen in the game's earlier stages. And once Mega Man reaches Magic Man, the final line of defense for Dr. Wily, Mega Man nearly gets deleted due to Magic Man being imbued with the power of the newly created life virus, assembled from those four programs Wily had acquired. At this point, the plot has been pretty standard for a game like this, not being outstanding, but decently engaging. That is, until Lan's father, Dr. Hikari, drops a massive lore bomb. Long ago, before Lan was born, Dr. Hikari had been hard at work trying to create the perfect Navi, complete with its own emotions and desires. The problem was, just making complex programs wasn't enough. There needed to be a deeper form of connection between Navis and their operators. In turn, Dr. Hikari began experimenting with creating Navis based on human DNA, on the basis that if both operator and Navi share the same DNA, they'd be able to grow emotionally alongside each other, creating the ultimate team. In theory, it sounded perfect, but during development, Dr. Hikari hit a roadblock, not able to fully complete his perfect Navi. Then, in his personal life, Hikari had his first son, Hub. As an infant, Hub unfortunately developed a serious health condition with his heart, leading to the baby becoming too feeble to continue living. Distraught, Dr. Hikari decided that he had to keep Hub alive however he could, and to put it simply, using the data he'd collected on the baby, Mega Man.exe was born, making Mega Man Land's twin brother the entire time. Man, talk about going from zero to a hundred just like that. I never would have guessed in a million years that the big twist of Battle Network was that Land's brother got uploaded to Twitter. Though now, with Land and Mega Man in perfect sync, it's time to confront Dr. Wily, whose motivations are also revealed. Like I covered earlier, the Battle Network games are set on an alternate timeline, and after Dr. Wily's robot research was rejected, he became increasingly bitter, holding a grudge against not only Dr. Hikari, the son of his rival, but also the entirety of network society and the world in general. So utilizing the life virus, Dr. Wily plans to infect military satellites around the world in order to cause widespread destruction everywhere, demolishing the internet in the process. And now, after all that buildup about the monstrous life virus, once Mega Man finally reaches it, it's, well, kind of a pushover. I mean, compared to Shark Man, the life virus is far more vulnerable. Hell, I didn't even build that great of a folder and it went down down after maybe two or three tries. To say the least, I felt it was pretty underwhelming. Though hey, that blemish aside, the crisis is averted, Dr. Wily seemingly going down with his lab as it collapses in on itself. Overall, a pretty solid story for the first entry of the series, but we're not done yet. On top of all that, Battle Network has a post-game. It's not really that incredible, as it more serves to pack in a few extra boss fights. However, at the very end of the post-game, a mysterious cloaked figure appears in the deepest part of the undernet, and as it turns out, out, it's Base.exe, Battle Network's take on Base from the core series. Aside from being the game's super boss and apparently wielding the power of the life virus, he doesn't really do anything else. You'd think defeating him would give you a special Navi chip, but unfortunately, it was only obtainable from a special event in Japan. Though do keep him in mind, we might just be seeing more of Base sometime soon. Anyways, now with the plot done, Battle Network 1 serves as a solid entry point for the series. It's not perfect, as some mechanics do get old, and exploring the internet can become especially confusing when each area looks almost exactly the same, even when you go into the undernet. Plus, there's also some other minor weirdness, like only being able to escape battles if you have a chip allowing you to do so. But other than that, it's a fun one. For me, one of the most enjoyable aspects of the game, aside from the battle system, is just how solid all the music is. If the internet theme of the game wasn't so good, those times I spent wandering around hoping I was going the right way would have been far worse. And that battle theme is nothing short of iconic. Where other games Game Boy Advance titles are usually remembered for having that particularly fuzzy sound to them, Battle Network made use of the handheld strengths, going full-on chiptune. And man, did it work. You have to remember, Battle Network was a launch title for the Game Boy Advance, so for the dev team to hit so many good points off the bat, it definitely shows how talented they were. In fact, years after Battle Network 1 released, Capcom remade the game for the DS, making the remake as a crossover with another certain Mega Man spinoff, though we'll have to talk about that another time. With the resounding success of Battle Network being crystal clear, in the tradition of Mega Man as a whole, it's time to give it a sequel. Surprisingly releasing the same year as its predecessor, Mega Man Battle Network 2 is as direct of an improvement of the original as you can get. From the beginning, Battle Network 2 solves one of my main complaints about the original with the internet, as since it's somewhere you're gonna be spending a lot of time in the game, it should at least vary in visuals a little bit, and 2 delivered all that and more. Now, instead of being a jumble of plain paths that lead to dead ends and new areas, Battle Network 2 organizes the internet into distinct sections, each section having a battle-free zone called a square. 
Square, where Mega Man can buy things, chat with other navvies or programs, and in certain squares, even go on forums. Hell, when you go on Yai's computer in this game, the area inside is just a straight-up GeoCities site. And that's not all, because with the actual battle system, quite a few things get refined. Most importantly, replacing the armor system introduced in the first game, Battle Network 2 expands on it with the style system. Gained by battling in a certain fashion, styles can completely change your approach to battles depending on the ones you have. In total, there's the Guts style, Custom style, Shield style, and Team style. If you get the Guts style, like I had for most of my base playthrough of 2, it allows you to deal more damage with the Mega Buster and not flinch when hit with an attack. It can be pretty useful, especially if you enjoy making use of the charge shot a lot. However, it does come at the cost of not being able to fire rapidly. If you get the Custom style, you can start out with 7 battle chips as opposed to the usual 5. It's a simple upgrade, but an incredibly useful one if you enjoy setting up massive chip attacks. Then, if you get the shield style, battles can be handled far more defensively, as you'll now start each battle with a damage barrier and the ability to shield attacks. And lastly, if you get the team style, the amount of navi chips you can put in the folder will go from 5 to 8, allowing certain program advances in the game to be even easier to set up. Though on top of all that, with each style comes a random element assigned to it, changing the charge attack of Mega Man and changing his elemental affinity. As the battle system was already complex, the style change system serves to add just enough to it to keep things fresh in the sequel. I swear, that flamethrower that came with Heat Guts saved me so many times. And aside from styles, the add mechanic would be tweaked as well, now requiring that you sacrifice chips to gain more slots. The amount of slots gained depending on the amount of chips you sacrifice, which can be pretty useful for all those times the game gives you chips that aren't too useful for the situation. Also, touching on folder building again, some minor things would change here as well, the limit on how many of the same standard battle chip you can use being decreased from 10 to 5, forcing the player to use a more varied strategy when it comes to battling. But to balance things after that, they'd also add a new type of code for chips that allows them to be used with any letter no matter what. Plus outside of all that, in Battle Network 2, subchips are introduced, Battle Network's equivalent of items in a standard RPG that can heal Mega Man, allow you to walk without triggering random encounters, or even unlock certain objects to obtain rare chips. However, in conjunction with that, Mega Man no longer heals after every battle, adding an extra layer of challenge to things, albeit a minor one. So past those integral changes, Battle Network 2 retains all the positive mechanics of the first entry, providing a heaping helping of things to jack into. Though of all the changes made, one of the most evident improvements over the original is the actual plot of the second game. Taking place three months after the events of the first game, Lan and Mega Man are taking full advantage of the peace they'd worked towards, planning to go on a vacation as summer break starts. The problem is, filling the void in the net crime scene left by World 3's defeat is a new net crime syndicate called Gospel, a group that is far more erratic and shrouded in mystery compared to its predecessor. Though we'll talk about them later. After getting out of school, Lan and friends take a test in order to become official net battlers for the city, each gaining their own license that you upgrade as you progress through the game. And good timing too, as immediately after that, one of Lan's friends gets into pretty fatal trouble due to her gas-powered water heater filling her house with toxic fumes. To say the least, it's definitely an escalation of the oven scenario from the first game. So after braving the fumes to save his friends, surprise surprise, there was a navvy behind everything the whole time, just like the first game, being operated by a repairman you see in town earlier in the game. However, instead of being after a special program that just happened to be in Lan's oven, this criminal is more realistic, planning to hold Lan's friend Yai for ransom due to her family being rich. Too bad for him though, as Airman.exe gets destroyed, thankfully saving Yai from death by water heater. Afterwards, when he's already escaped, this is where things start to deviate much further from the original. If you hadn't already guessed, he was actually part of Gospel the entire time, and unlike the semi-cartoony World 3, Gospel is much more sinister off the bat, causing his briefcase to explode after he failed the mission. But hey, who cares? about him. Now it's time for that aforementioned vacation, Lan and friends going to a campsite. In keeping with the trend of making things more dangerous than the first game, Gospel really wants to cause destruction, attempting to explode a dam to flood the city. Along with pretty high stakes, this scenario is also really unique, as Lan has to deactivate each remote detonator individually found at the campsite, finding the last one with the only other character there that had a unique sprite. Like I said, in the first game, a lot of the story bosses, especially early on, weren't 
aren't very challenging, their attacks generally being easy to figure out. Well, to say the least, Capcom decided to stop playing around, as with Quickman.exe, Battle Network 2's second boss, I was absolutely annihilated. If anything, I kind of deserved it, since I wanted more fights like Proto Man that make you figure out other ways to damage the boss. But man, is it intimidating when he starts going all over the place. Once that wears off, though, a couple wide swords will do the trick, Proto Man saving the day at the last minute before Quick Man has the chance to blow everything up. Compared to the first game, at this point, Battle Network 2 had already surpassed it in my eyes, with much more still to come. For example, after here, Lan gets access to this game's equivalent of side quests, another new addition. They're not all that special themselves, but it doesn't hurt to have them. More decent content is always good, after all. Plus, they do become necessary later on when you want to get the highest license rank possible in the game. In fact, while I was going about doing the first few side quests, I was hit with a bit of a surprise. You see, once you've defeated an enemy Navi, you can fight stronger versions of them on the internet to get battle chips of them. It happened in the first game too, but I only learned it was possible after beating the game. And who did I stumble upon but the second version of Quick Man? As someone who doesn't always have the best reaction time, he destroyed me yet again to say the least. But anyways, moving on with the plot, as Mega Man and Lan continue exploring the internet, they stumble upon a tragedy in the internet of Yumland, a foreign country. Even despite their previous plans both ending in failure, Gospel seems to only be growing stronger, the group basically deleting nearly all the navvies in the square of Yumland's internet with the help of Cutman.exe, one of Battle Network 2's easier fights. So once Gospel sets their sights on Electopia, the country Lan lives in, chaos ensues, Lan, Chod, and a few others being the only line of defense protecting the science lab's mother computer from being hacked into. And as it turns out, the navvy working under Gospel this time is Shadow Man, who in the first game served as a super boss you encounter on the way to fight base. Like the first game, he's fairly challenging, maintaining the overall difficulty of Battle Network 2. But things are about to get even harder in the next scenario. Expanding the world of Battle Network further, next up is Land's trip to Netopia, Battle Network's version of America and Europe. Going there on official net battler business to figure out how best to get rid of Gospel, this segment features quite a few solid battles, with Thunder Man, Snake Man, and Night Man, the latter being operated by the queen of another foreign country, who while working for Gospel, attended the meeting to sabotage it, placing everyone in an actual dungeon and using the traps already there to severely injure them. And of course, since it hasn't happened yet, during this scenario we also get the obligatory Proto Man fight, because Chod's gotta be a rival sometimes. The problem for me was, in this part of the game, I still hadn't really mastered how to build folders correctly, so fights that were already challenging became twice as hard. Take Thunder Man's second version, when I was trying to beat him, I'm pretty sure it took me an entire hour to do it. Also, battles aside, meanwhile you walk around Nettopia, Lan actually runs into Higsby, the villain turned shopkeep from the first game. Glad to see he's now able to straight up travel the world. Though getting back on track, the action doesn't stop yet, as after the dungeon debacle, Lan's plane ride home gets sabotaged, a gospel operator using his navvy magnetman.exe to mess with the plane's major systems. If there's one thing these games are good at, it's throwing Lan into these especially tense situations that when you think about it, aren't the most unrealistic. Unfortunately, after hitting you back to back with engaging scenarios, up next is at least for me the worst part of the game. Between the big scenarios that get their own personalized stages, it's not uncommon for Battle Network to have plot points that take place primarily on the internet, sometimes with an enemy navvy involved. Usually they're perfectly fine and don't outstay their welcome. That is, until the Freeze Man scenario. At first, there's nothing wrong with it, the plot point this time being that random chunks of ice have appeared all across the web, affecting major climate-related systems in every country. Like all the other premises, it's a solid one, and to make things better, during this scenario is when we get to properly enter this game's iteration of the Undernet, unlike the first one actually looking very distinct from the rest of the internet, along with it getting its own theme. It all sounds fine, right? Well, the issue is, to get rid of all the ice on the internet, it takes an annoying amount of backtracking, going back and forth between the normal internet and the Undernet to get the necessary things to break the ice, everything culminating with a fight with Freeze Man. Granted, what made things a bit better is you can go back to Netopia and take advantage of a jack in point that puts you close to the undernet, but it's still pretty tedious. Though hey, at least during this segment you can fight a new optional boss, operated by none other than Mr. Match, the very first villain from the first game. Apparently he's reformed now, so good for him. As far as designs go, his new Navi Heat Man has one of my favorites in the series. But moving past the Freeze Man stuff, now we're approaching the finale. 
After the defeat of Freeze Man, even with all the ice destroyed, the place where you fought him, Kotobuki Square, began being distorted by unknown forces. And after Lan's father looked into it, apparently Kotobuki Town was also experiencing a massive spike of electromagnetic radiation, revealing that the entire town was Gospel's base all along. So donning a suit that protects him from radiation, Lan goes to Kotobuki, the town slowly distorting as an apartment building appears to be entering the internet itself. Talk about a step up from the cartoony base Wily had in the first one. If you look around, you can even find a few stragglers succumbing to radiation poisoning. Without a doubt, the tone has been set, and with the help of his friends who've also donned protective suits, it's time to climb up the distorted condo. Fitting in with the state of things in the real world, the final stage that accompanies the condo is also heavily distorted, formerly defeated bosses showing up to try to slow down your progress. Though once you've defeated them all again, Lan is finally met with the leader of Gospel. Immediately, he comes off as very delusional, proclaiming his hatred for reality and his aims to control the internet with a so-called Super Navi. And after an incredibly anime moment, it's revealed that the Super Navi is actually Base.exe, or at least a recreation of him from computer bugs and powerful programs that Gospel had acquired. It's pretty insane how they were already somewhat setting the groundwork for this in the first game. But regardless, it's time to battle, Base bombarding Mega Man with a storm of attacks before being defeated like the imitation he is. Now, with Base defeated, Gospel's leader gets backed into a corner, his protective suit failing and revealing he was actually just a kid all along. In fact, earlier on in the game, he shows up during the airplane segment without any dialogue. Overcome by desperation, Gospel's leader decides to overload the server's powering base, raising the radiation to deadly levels even with the suit on and mutating base's form into a massive beast called a multi-bug organism. Let me tell you, compared to the wimpy life virus of the first game, the multi-bug organism, otherwise known as Gospel, is no joke. Constantly attacking Attacking you with all sorts of projectiles and only being vulnerable directly after attacking, it essentially tests everything you've learned over the course of the game, taking some serious skill to win. Or you know, if you have a strong program advance, that works too. Either way, just like everything else in the game, it surpasses the original final boss by a mile, taking me many tries until I finally bested it. And once you've saved the internet from being destroyed by Gospel, it turns out the Gospel leader wasn't as one-dimensional as he appeared, his diary revealing that at a younger age, he lost both with his parents in a plane crash, only to be taken in by cruel relatives who abused him. So even despite inheriting a fortune from his deceased parents, nothing could fill the loneliness he experienced, the child eventually becoming obsessed with computers as they were the only things that never betrayed him. After some time, using the connections he'd gained online, the child started gospel to get back at the world that wronged him, falling further and further into his delusions. This is made even more apparent when the kid wakes up, shouting at Lan to finish him off and that he just wants to die. It's pretty heavy stuff that makes the entire game far more compelling. In the end though, as Lan lends a helping hand to the kid, saying he'll be his first friend after he atones for his crimes, he finally breaks down, emerging from his sadness. And well, that's about it. The game ending on Lan and friends having another campout, Lan's dad revealing that Sean, the name of Gospel's leader, was being influenced and manipulated by an unknown source through the suit he wore. Because you know, it's practically guaranteed there's gonna be another battle network, may as well leave a little cliffhanger. But wait, if the first first game is any indication, we're not done yet, because Battle Network 2 has an even larger post-game. Combined with finishing all the quests and getting the triple S license, if you happen to venture deep into the undernet, there's a chance you'll stumble upon a secret area of the internet. When I myself was going through the game, I didn't even know it existed, running into the area by accident and being utterly shocked, as even though you defeated them in the first game, hidden within the undernet is the World 3 area, accompanied by one of the absolute best tracks in the game, scaring the hell out of me when I found it, the World 3 area is the only place in the game where you can't jack out at will, forcing you to make sure you've prepared before venturing inside. And once you've gone in, get ready to fight, as next to Pharaoh Man who returns from the first game, two new enemy navi appear, Napalm Man and Planet Man, the latter being the temporary leader of World 3 as the group reforms. But they're not where the actual challenge in this area really lies, since after defeating Planet Man, as you make your way to the exit, an ominous presence stops Mega Man in his tracks, revealing a itself to be the true base, the battle-hungry Navi reprising his role as a super boss, this time actually having dialogue. Clearly, Capcom did a pretty good job of sprinkling in content that makes you want to play the next game, though with the defeat of base again, Battle Network 2 is over. It's not often that you see a sequel surpass its predecessor in so many ways. Even with the minor problems it has, Battle Network 2 is a brilliant game that continues to make the best of its genius battle system. Oh, and the music this time was superb as well. Guess that isn't a big surprise, but I'd highly 
recommend checking some of it out after you watch this video. And now, as Capcom had essentially pumped out two solid titles within the span of a year, Battle Network quickly became a successful franchise in its own right, becoming a pretty big deal for the Game Boy Advance, and even getting its own manga with an anime adaptation. Trust me, we'll go into the anime another time. The thing is, while of course a third game would enter development immediately, that's not what we're gonna talk about just yet. Instead, let's look at the first two spin-offs of Battle Network. Yep, you heard me right. Taking the level of spin-offs to a whole new level, Capcom decided Battle Network had become so massive, it deserved more games outside of the main series, which honestly baffled me when I first discovered this. So starting with the one that actually got localized outside of Japan, there's Mega Man Network Transmission, a game that released just before the third game would. I'll be real with you guys, this game is an enigma. Like, imagine if they took the Mario and Luigi games, for instance, another RPG spin-off of a platformer series, and turned it back into a platformer. Well, that's basically what Network Transmission is. Coming out on the GameCube, what's even more bizarre is Network Transmission canonically takes place after the first game. Meanwhile, at this point, the second game had already released, and even the third in Japan. I guess it may have been to drive people to go buy more copies of 2, but even then, in the rest of the world, it came out shortly before the third game's release, so it probably didn't have its intended effect. Anyways, the real question is, did they manage to make it into a solid side game? The answer's no. I'm not beating around the bush this time. At a glance, it appears to play similarly to other side-scrolling Mega Man games, but where the weirdness sets in is what mechanics carried over from the base Battle Network games. For one, it has the chip system, working pretty much just how it does normally, complete with program advances. The issue is, and you won't believe this, mechanics made for an RPG don't really work that great in a platformer. Shocking, I know. Since normally, when the random chips you get aren't what you need, you can continue the battle and get more when the custom bar refills. The battle's pace not really being disturbed by it, but in network transmission, the custom bar ends up as more of a hindrance than anything. After all, there's nothing that causes gameplay to grind to a screeching halt like waiting for a meter to charge so you can continue without dying. This is made worse by the fact that instead of letting you use chips as much as you want to while having them, network transmission also added a new meter that keeps you from using chips when it's empty. Hearing that, you must be thinking, well, why don't you use the Mega Buster? Surely network transmission has has that, and you're right, it does. Take a look at it, why don't you? Yep, it has the Mega Buster specifically from Battle Network, meaning that at the start of the game, it's straight up useless. So combining all these wonderful characteristics together, Network Transmission ends up being mind-numbingly tedious and hard at first. The first boss, Fireman, proving to be a nightmare, since your only reliable method of attack are chips. Chips that take slightly longer to use than just shooting with the Mega Buster. In turn, when there's an opening to attack, it's practically inevitable that Fireman's attack will hit you due to his attacks coming out faster faster than yours. Not to mention, his attacks can cover half the stage, which is really just lovely. Putting it plainly, it's just a badly designed game. And hilariously, after you get the chance to upgrade your Mega Buster a bit, the game becomes boringly easy, it being far more optimal to just rely on the Mega Buster like you would in a standard Mega Man game. It sucks too, because in Network Transmission, they wasted the Battle Network version of Zero. Like come on man, couldn't you have used that in, I don't know, the actual main series? Fun fact? they never do. Fittingly, the plot is pretty garbage as well. Basically, it all revolves around members of a crumbling World 3 using a new virus called the Zero Virus to corrupt navvies. The virus, of course, coming from Zero, who in Battle Network is a sentient virus. Then, using funds they'd amassed from selling fake vaccines for the Zero Virus, World 3 resurrects the Life Virus, which dies immediately at the hands of Mega Man. The end. Even when things could have been interesting, with a base fight also happening in this game, it ends up being heavily anti climatic as the fight gets cut short. To give a little credit, the whole concept of Zero being a sentient virus that wishes to be a Navi is a pretty cool concept. Again, too bad it was used here. If anyone out there played Network Transmission as an entry into the Battle Network series, I want you to know I'm truly sorry. At the very least, the game managed to pull it through music-wise. It's honestly what kept me cognizant as I went through this mess. However, this is one of two platformer spin-offs made off of Battle Network, the other being a Wonderswan game exclusively released 
released in Japan. Like network transmission, this one is also pretty bizarre, featuring more or less the same chip system minus both the custom gauge and the extra gauge that you needed to use chips. Other than that, it's much closer to a classic Mega Man game, the main issue it hits being poor level design. Hell, this game even made the Mega Buster work like normal, who would have thought a Wonderswan game could figure that out over a GameCube one? And aside from that, what makes this game truly bizarre is its plot, as rather than every other game attached to Battle Network, the Wonderswan one is an adaptation of the anime's plot. Basically, it's kind of the Pokemon Yellow of the series. In fact, as Network Transmission used the dated armor system from the first game, the Wonderswan game took advantage of styles from the second. Honestly, if you were to combine the good aspects of both these games, you'd have yourself a decent enough platformer. Too bad we don't live in that timeline. But that's enough talk on these things. With them out of the way, it's time to dive into Mega Man Battle Network 3. Taking a bit longer to develop this time, as it'd come out a full year after the second game, Battle Network 3's release would differ from the previous two. In Japan, after it was released late into 2002, an improved second version of it would release a few months later. So when the game got localized across the world, while maintaining the bug fixes of the second version, the game would receive the Pokémon treatment, being split into the blue version and the white version, each one having slightly different things. For instance, depending on the version you get, some structures in the game have different colors, one of of the bosses in the game differ depending on the version, a few chips are version exclusive, and each game has its own exclusive style. Plus, weirdly enough, in the blue version specifically, there's the added optional fight with Punk.exe. Outside of being a cool fight, it is a bit pointless though, since the actual Punk chip was only distributed in Japan. Or you know, if you're playing the game on one of those handy-dandy special Game Boy advances, you can always use a cheat code to get it. But besides that minor detail, in my opinion, Battle Network 3 somehow continues the trend to two set of improving everything, being my personal favorite out of the three. To start, let's focus on what it changed. Like the second game, the third actually further improved the layout of the internet, using different colors on paths to keep things from being confusing, and actually adding some proper fast travel. Man, you don't know how grateful I was for this addition. As much as I preferred two's internet to the endless identical paths of one, it became a bit annoying not having any solid form of fast travel outside of physically going to other jack endpoints. That's still a thing, mind you, but in each of those, there's now also fast travel to specific squares. Overall, 3 has my favorite internet to say the least. And battle-wise, things stay relatively the same, with the only real changes being the specification of chips into three categories of rarity. Standard chips only allowing for four copies per folder, mega chips only allowing for five per folder, and especially useful giga chips only allowing one per folder. Plus, if you manage to cut enemies off in the middle of their attack, you can get bug fragments. In the previous game, they were found randomly and could be used to trade for special chips, but in this game, they have a couple important uses. Like before, there's still a currency for special trading, but alongside being used for unlocking important things later on, there's the newly implemented Virus Breeder. Basically, after a certain point in the game, when going around the internet, you can run into special viruses that you can tame. Once tamed, they serve as a way to get decently strong chips if you feed them bug fragments. And honestly, I think the whole concept is pretty cool. Just more fun stuff to expand the game further. But above all that, possibly the most important addition that 3 added is the Navi Customizer. Replacing the simplistic power-up system, the Navi Customizer serves as a new approach to making Mega Man stronger, certain pieces doing simple things like strengthening Mega Man's attack, speed, or charge, and other pieces giving more complex benefits. There's even a piece that makes Mega Man tell puns every time you talk to him, which is straight up one of my favorite things ever. Not to mention, when you put a piece in that uses a color not accepted, there's the error mechanic, each error requiring a certain code to work. And after inputting the core corresponding code, sometimes everything works fine. But for some errors, there can be either a positive effect on Mega Man or a negative one. However, if you glitch the system by placing pieces where they don't belong, Mega Man can gain the bug style, a style that depending on what glitch happens can help or hurt Mega Man, much like the error mechanic. All in all, it's pretty complex, filling that requirement of differentiating the game from the other ones. Oh, and I can't forget about the style change system, as things get tweaked here too. For the already existing styles, minor changes are implemented. Each stage giving you three special customization pieces as you level them up. Plus, depending on the version, you could get access to the Shadow Style or the Ground Style. The Shadow Style allowing Mega Man to shortly become invisible, and the Ground Style allowing Mega Man to crack any panel he hits. And of course, those styles also come with three special customization pieces as well. But past all that, when it comes to the improvements with Battle Network 3, the largest undoubtedly came with the game's plot. 
Again, taking place months after the events of Battle Network 2, things start out during a period of general stability, net crime remaining low, and no net mafia groups thriving like Gospel did. In fact, this game ends up having its very own tournament arc, Lan and friends being approached to join the N1 Grand Prix, a competition to discover the most powerful net battler across the world. Basically, it kind of replaces the function licenses served in the first half of the second game, many internet activities early on being trials to move up to the next qualification rank of the N1. Though after entering that, Dex, one of Lan's best friends throughout the games, left something at school, prompting the kids to go there with him to help retrieve it. Unfortunately for them, while there, they just happened to stumble upon an act of crime taking place. A mysterious man trying to steal something called a Tetra Code from the principal's computer. In turn, once the man's navvy Flashman hypnotized Lan's friends, it's time to go into the first stage of Battle Network 3, the mechanics this time being pretty unique, as you have to manipulate things in the real world to progress. Of note, and it's not exclusive to this stage either, one thing I love about the internet and stages of Battle Network 3 are how structurally they bear a passing resemblance to their real world counterparts. The squirrel statue in ACDC Park appearing on the net as well, for example. Anyways, despite having a pretty cool design, Flashman doesn't stand a chance, it being revealed after his defeat that the group they belonged to was none other than World 3, having completely revived despite Mega Man crushing their revival in 2. But hey, who cares about any of that? It's time to go to the zoo. Dex bringing along his little brother Chisao, who he'd recently reunited with for the first time since they were toddlers. The weird thing is, at the zoo, all the animals seem overly agitated for some reason, it all culminating with the animals escaping their cages, and a condor even kidnapping Chisao. How on earth is this related to networks, you ask? Well, it is, somehow. After jacking into the zoo's network, it's revealed that the zoo's new owner that took over recently had surgically implanted chips into all the animals, using his navvy Beastman.exe to send them into a blind rage. We're hitting a whole new level of messed up antagonists this time, and much like Quick Man from the previous game, Beastman keeps you on your toes, his rapid attacks taking me by surprise. Though after the cumulative 50 or so hours I'd spent on the first two games, Beastman didn't last too long. World 3 losing yet again, but managing to escape with the second Tetra Code, much like how things played out with them before. Oh, and real quick, I need to mention the riddle mechanic of this stage, because the dialogue during this portion is absolutely ridiculous in all the best ways. You can tell the writers were having fun here. But speaking of World 3, after the zoo incident, everyone's favorite former member returns, Higsby. This time around, reopening his shop and employing child labor in the form of Lan. <laughs> what a great guy. So one bubble man later, Lan, Dex, Yai, and of course, Chad make it into the N1 Grand Prix, passing all the preliminaries effortlessly. However, before we get to that, for the first time in all of Battle Network, Chad actually receives some proper character development, his highly competitive and standoffish nature actually resulting from his uncaring father, who in his pursuits as the president of a highly successful electronics company, treats his son extremely coldly, only expecting him to constantly train and be perfect, the game hinting that he outright refuses to eat dinner with his son. Even when Chad asks a simple question of whether his father will watch him in the N1, he berates his son for wasting his time. It's always good seeing a rival character actually be given a solid reason for acting the way they do. And believe me, things will get even heavier further into the game. But for now, let's get into the N1, the contestants being made up of familiar faces and entirely new characters, like Tora with his Navi Kingman and the totally not suspicious at all Net Battler Q. And once the introductions are over, all the contestants are taken by boat to the ominous Hades Isle, where a series of trials whittled down the number of contestants to just eight, everyone being split into pairs of two to fight for who will qualify for the finals. And can I say, Sharkman losing to Kingman is the most fitting thing ever, considering how tough Kingman is to fight. So now, after Lan defeats Dex and Gutsman yet again, the tournament arc is at its finale, Lan facing off against Tora and Chad facing off against Q, the latter fight culminating in the reveal of Desertman.exe, his operator Q turning out to be the very man who spearheaded the entire tournament, who of course is also part of World 3, attempting to use the tournament as a way to undermine anyone who opposes the group, even going so far as to tie up Chad's father in order to coerce Chad into handing over Proto Man. Thankfully, Lan arrives just in time to toss his pet as a diversion, thwarting that man's plans and barely defeating Desert Man, at least in my case. Overall, the N1 is a really solid plot point in 3, tying together the first half of the game and paving the way for the second half, because next up is possibly the best scenario in the entire series so far. 
After the Grand Prix is over, Lan and friends take a visit to the hospital, as during the tournament, Yai managed to fall on her head by accident. Due to the world's advanced medical technology, she's doing perfectly fine, but while Lan visits the hospital, he meets a young terminally ill boy named Mamoru. As it turns out, Mamoru is a big fan of Lan's, having watched all of the N1 Grand Prix. And when Lan visits the hospital, Mamoru had snuck out to the beach as he wasn't looking forward to the medical tests scheduled for him later that day. But with Lan's encouragement, he returns to the hospital. Then, a bit later on, after helping Tora out and going through a surprisingly emotional scene where Dex moves out of ACDC Town, Lan returns to Momoru, the young kid watching the waves on the beach again. As he reveals, Momoru has been hospitalized most of his life, the view on the beach being one of his only escapes available since he's never had a chance to make any friends. Hearing that, Lan gladly offers to be the kid's friend, attempting to cheer him up by seeing if he wants a special battle chip. The problem is, after finding out what chip he wants, Momoru's excitement triggers his heart condition a condition that turns out to be the very same one that killed Mega Man when he was still Hub. Luckily for Mamoru, since Mega Man was all too familiar with the attacks brought on by the condition, he manages to stabilize Mamoru, allowing Lan to quickly get him inside the hospital. Later, worried sick for his newfound friend, Lan learns from a nurse that in actuality, there's been a recent medical breakthrough that could actually cure Mamoru. The problem is, after undergoing surgery three times already, he'd long since lost hope in the possibility of being cured preventing the operation from happening. So freshly invigorated to help their friend, Lan and Mega Man managed to obtain the special chip Mamoru wanted, not only giving it to him, but also telling Mega Man's story from when he was still Hub. Compared to pretty much the entirety of the first two games, Mamoru's character arc is really something else, the writers pulling out all the stops to make this kid's plight a very real one. And it's not done yet, as right when Mamoru goes in for surgery, the hospital's power is shut down, a World 3 operative using their Navi Plant Man exe to manipulate the massive tree growing in the center of the hospital, jeopardizing the lives of everyone inside, Mamoru especially. Like, Battle Network was always good at creating a sense of urgency, but nothing in any of the first three games compares to this, Lan racing to stop Plant Man before his friend dies in the middle of surgery. So despite that catastrophe happening, somehow Mamoru's surgery was successful, the child no longer remaining terminally ill, and after a recovery period, set to finally go back to his family. A happy the ending for what could have been a disaster, and now that we're past that massive block of character development, it's time for Lan to receive some of his own. Once the hospital segment ends, Lan goes back to the science lab, only to meet none other than Mr. Match. Reaffirming his stance from the second game that he'd reformed from his criminal ways, Mr. Match sends Lan on a number of tasks to supposedly protect the net. However, when you look like that, it's pretty clear you're still a villain, and surprise surprise, he is, forcing Lan into some backtracking to put out fires across the internet. Thankfully though, it didn't feel as tedious compared to the Freeze Man nonsense, and once the fires are all put out, it's time to venture into 3's version of the Undernet, a battle with Mr. Match's new Navi Flameman.exe quickly ensuing. From Heatman to this, they really do give his navvies a lot of cool designs. But despite everything, Mega Man isn't even the one who ends up defeating Flame Man, none other than Base showing up to crush the Navi like it's nothing. So in typical Base fashion, he immediately challenges Mega Man, the fight being a script of loss and shattering what little confidence Lan had left. And unlike the previous appearances of Base, this time the all-powerful Navi had allied himself with World 3, their mutual goals for obtaining power aligning. Needless to say, after all that, Lan's general motivation had been utterly destroyed, since by doing Mr. Match's bidding, he'd unknowingly aided World 3, even putting his father in mortal danger. In turn, slowly being overcome by his guilt, Lan even stopped going to school, rejecting his friend's attempts to help him as he didn't believe he deserved it. However, out of everyone he talks to, Chad of all people ended up being the one that made a breakthrough with Lan, getting him to go see his father. And when Lan arrives, he runs into Gospel's former leader, Sean. Trying to make amends for his crimes, Sean has been hard at work helping the science lab combat net crime, it being confirmed that in Battle Network 2, Wily had been influencing him. It's always neat seeing a series take advantage of the characters it's already established. But moving on, once Lan gets a top quality pep talk from his father, his confidence returns turns in full, going back to the science lab and joining the ongoing offensive against World 3. Unfortunately, at this point of the game, we hit another backtracking segment, since in order to acquire the forbidden program needed to combat the beast World 3 is reawakening, Mega Man needs to meet the strongest Navi in the Undernet, the only way to do that being rising up a ranking system. So many fights later made kind of worth it with the ridiculous yet strong Navi Bull Man who you have to fight to become ranked 2, Mega Man meets the king of the Undernet, Serenade. 
Yexi. You're not able to see the Navi's face, but since Mega Man became rank 2, Serenade bestows the Forbidden Program, the game throwing a massive twist at you directly after with the reveal that Mamoru is actually the administrator of the Undernet. You see, long ago, Mamoru's father created the Undernet, separate from the rest of the internet, as a place to prevent others from accessing the Forbidden Program, its separation from the rest of the internet attracting all sorts of criminals to it. And while it's not explicitly said in the game, it's heavily hinted that Mamoru is actually the operator of Serenade, showing that even though he may be frail in the normal world, the power he has online is undisputed. Though now, with that being said, it's time for the finale of Battle Network 3. Immediately after getting the Forbidden Program, World 3 manages to take the beast they'd been searching for all along, an entity called Alpha, the defeat of the Navi who stole it not changing the fact that World 3's plans were coming together, what with Base being on their side. And as it's soon revealed, Alpha is no laughing matter, the entity actually being a prototype of the modern internet, who after becoming riddled with bugs, developed a very low level of intelligence, assimilating all devices, programs, and Navis connected to it until it had absorbed the entire cyber world, causing a six-month blackout for anything that relied on the net. The only reason it wasn't a worse catastrophe was due to the internet not being as widespread at the time, but in the modern times of Battle Network, Alpha's revival could destroy everything. That's no exaggeration either, since as World 3 begins to unleash Alpha, it caused automated tanks to attack cities. In response, to keep Alpha from unleashing mass destruction, Lan and a team of other capable net battlers set off to the new island base of World 3 entering without a doubt my favorite final portion out of the three games. I mean, just listen to that music! You've gotta give me that one. Just be glad I haven't spent more time gushing about the music. I swear, in another timeline, I could have been a channel that exclusively talks about game tunes. Though so this video doesn't take up your entire day, let's keep going. Once the team enters Wily's lab, they're joined by another ally, a man named Kosak who's appeared throughout the entire game. To put it simply, he reveals here that the monstrous base was actually his creation when he was trying to make a navi with complete independence. What happened was, when Alpha initially started corrupting devices, Base was falsely accused of being the culprit, Science Lab sending a team to delete him and excommunicating Kosak. The thing is, Base never was deleted. After being left to die with a fatal slash across his chest, Base crawled through the recesses of the internet, his urge to get revenge on humans being the only drive he had left as he battled countless viruses and absorbed the corpses of any Navi who'd happened to fall in battle. So now, not only is there the threat of Alpha to the internet, but also the threat of Base, who'd been set up over the course of all three games. And once Mega Man braves the trials of endless claw machines, Lan confronts Wily, all the other members of World 3 lying unconscious after they'd transmitted their minds to the internet and been defeated alongside their navvies. In turn, when Wily joins his comrades and goes into the internet itself, Lan has no choice but to follow, transmitting his mind and merging with Mega Man, becoming the ultimate team for real this time. I've gotta say, while it fits the setup, I definitely didn't expect Battle Network to go full Final Fantasy V with the stage literally being made of flesh and organs. Anyways, as base absorbs the final barrier keeping Alpha restrained, it's time for the actual mandatory base fight, the independent Navi causing me a fair bit of trouble with the aura he regenerates throughout the fight. Honestly, if I hadn't taken advantage of the wood style I had, since it regenerates health when you stand on grass panels, I may not have been able to beat him. And that goes for the next fight too, because after base's defeat, Alpha reawakens, consuming both Wily and base before initiating the game's final Final battle. For real, if you'd have told me this game ended with Mega Man fighting the actual internet, I wouldn't have believed you. It's astounding how the team developing Battle Network managed to top themselves twice. Though in my case, with the help of Grass Stage, Alpha's defenses got pierced, Mega Man saving the internet from another internet. Except unlike the other final bosses, after Alpha disappears, it leaves a door behind, the data held within turning out to be an archived personality of Lan and Hub's deceased grandfather, the man who not only created the internet, but 
created Alpha as well. I was wondering when we get to see the Battle Network version of Dr. Light. As he tells his grandsons, in life, he stored data of himself within the Guardian program to keep Alpha from ever escaping, managing to give a letter to Land for him to pass on to his father before everything starts collapsing. And as if everything couldn't be more final, on the way out of Alpha, a dying part of it catches the duo mid-escape, trapping the two of them within itself as it crumbles. Realizing their situation, instead of the two dying alongside Alpha, Mega Man makes a tough decision. Ever grateful for his second chance at life, Mega Man decides to overload himself to create an opening for Land to escape. No matter how much I write about this scene, I just can't do it justice for how much it hits you during this segment. When I myself was going through it, the dialogue even managed to make me emotional, something not many games are able to do. If anything, it's the desperation in Land's dialogue as he begs his brother not to go, only to be met with Mega Man thanking Land for everything. It got to me, man. So despite the loss of Mega Man, World 3 is dismantled once more, Land and friends somehow returning to safety. Hell, Chad even gets the admiration of his father here, which is pretty deserved considering how much of a Chad he was throughout the game. But amidst everyone's celebration, Land continued to mourn the loss of Mega Man, his brother's absence forcing him to grow up a bit. In turn, four months later, after the defeat of World 3, Lan is about to enter the sixth grade, returning to the beach to say some heartfelt words to Mega Man, since in his upcoming school year, he'll be forced to get a new Navi. However, as this is a game aimed towards a younger audience, Capcom couldn't end things off too dark, because right after the credits, Lan's father manages to recreate Mega Man, the brothers happily united once more. What a great ending, seriously. The best part is, like I'm sure you'd guessed by now, Battle Network 3 also has a postgame, this time the postgame taking place in Serenade's domain, things playing out pretty much like the last postgame, complete with Base returning as a super boss. Granted, due to Alpha, his memories are entirely wiped. Also, just a side note, try guessing the name of this Navi. What do you think? Well, your guess is probably wrong, because his name is straight up Japanman.exe. What an absolute legend. And apparently, according to a few illusions the game makes, there's a pretty good chance he's the Navi that inflicted Base's wound. I will say, where this postgame stands out compared to the previous one is how mystical Serenade's area appears, with the actual Navi himself coming with very interesting dialogue. Plus, once you defeat Serenade, the game gives you some time attacks to tackle, so the amount of content 3 has to offer definitely surpassed the previous two games. But with that, Battle Network 3 is entirely finished. When you look at these three games, they truly form the perfect trilogy, each game having its own story complete with certain plot points that carry over from game to game. Not only that, but the improvements each game brings to the table keeps the stellar gameplay from ever becoming too stale. What's crazy is somehow, all three games came out within the span of two years, somehow achieving a level of quality not seen in a lot of games. In terms of Battle Network 3, I can confidently say now that it rightfully deserves a place next to all the best games of the Game Boy Advance. You'd utilizing the handheld strengths in every way it could. And after the release of 3, Battle Network would completely explode, the third game far outselling its predecessors. Seeing that, with dollar signs in its eyes, Capcom pulled the Capcom, giving the series not one, but three more mainline games after the original trilogy. So to give me time to properly play those, and any other games related to the series, I'll have to make this my first two-parter video in years. If you're watching this in the future and it's already out, I'll make sure to put a video card here so you can go directly to part 2. But for everyone here in the present, expect part 2 in around 1 to 2 months. Gotta play through these games thoroughly, after all. For updates on my progress with the games, do check out my Twitter. I promise I'll be more active on it. And now, to those who've continued to help out the channel, I'd like to give a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's decided to contribute. You guys are the best. If you want to help me continue making videos, and receive a special thank you amongst a lot of other cool stuff, do check out my Patreon, link in the description. For real, thank Thanks a ton for watching all the way through this one. Playing through these games have been a real joy, for the most part, and I'm curious to say the least about what's in store. I've heard rumors about the fourth game in particular, but I'll just have to see for myself. So that being said, I'm the RPG Monger, and don't forget that each and every one of you are fantastic. And real quick, thanks a ton for 200,000 subs everyone. Believe me, if 2020 was me rebuilding my channel, 2021 is gonna be the new rise.